Well-known producer Rick Rubin has collaborated with some of the biggest stars in the music business. Rubin is known for his work in the hip-hop and rock genres, but he also has produced some records in other genres, including country and pop. He's one of the most successful producers of all time, with numerous Grammy Awards to his credit. If this is your first time here, welcome! Please subscribe and give a like. Here are 10 things you probably didn't know about Rick Rubin. Number 10. Rick channels his creativity through meditation. What many people don't know about Rick Rubin is that he has been meditating regularly since he was just 14 years old thanks to a recommendation from his pediatrician. As a creative force, meditation has helped Rick Rubin in many ways. For one, it has allowed him to focus more on the task at hand and be less distracted by outside forces. Additionally, it has always allowed him to become more in touch with his own thoughts and feelings, which has led to a greater understanding of himself and his work. Finally, meditation has simply made him feel happier and more content with his life in general, something that no doubt contributes to his creative success. He describes himself as a person who is always discovering new things about the spiritual world and a spiritual seeker. And in the time that he has spent as a producer, he has gone through a major transformation for the better. In the beginning, he was more of a tyrant and very much dictatorial, which is possibly one of the reasons that the Beastie Boys left his label. He was very much in control of everything. Number 9. He has never used either drugs or alcohol. Rubin became captivated at an early age by rock and roll with a standard length haircut, a leather jacket, and a role in The Pricks, a punk band. Drugs and alcohol were one aspect of his alternative lifestyle that he avoided entirely. Rubin's degree of concentration and diligence was impressive, especially for someone of his young age. He admitted to USA Today that he knew kids who, out of boredom, experimented with drugs or excessive drinking, but he didn't want to give up his spare time in that way. Because of his youth and maturity, Rubin was able to resist the need to amuse or distract himself by becoming really into something. Number 8. He joined Run DMC and Aerosmith on Walk This Way Since the early 1980s, Rubin has had the desire to collaborate with Run DMC. Despite the fact that they were managed by Russell Simmons and signed to Profile Records, Rubin was on the verge of becoming a household name as the most in-demand hip-hop producer on the East Coast. They were so impressed with what he was accomplishing with LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys that they asked him to contribute on their following album, Raising Hell. Run DMC originally wanted to sample portions of Aerosmith's Walk This Way, but Rick suggested that the rap group join with the iconic rock band to create a new version of that track which was first released in 1975 and reached number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. This partnership helped to resurrect Aerosmith's career while simultaneously catapulting Run DMC to the forefront of popular culture. The album was the first hip-hop record to enter Billboard's Top 10 and hit number 3 on the Billboard Top 200 album chart. Additionally, it was the first album of any genre to receive a perfect score from the influential publication Rolling Stone. Number 7. He was the first DJ for the Beastie Boys Working together, the Beastie Boys and Rick Rubin were a key factor in hip-hop's final phase of development, which saw it emerge from the underground and urban music to become the massive industry and cultural phenomenon it is today. Rubin was brought into the Beastie Boys' fold at the height of their success in the punk scene. On the other hand, they wished to incorporate rap into their concert, and they thought Rick Rubin would be the perfect person to do so. Back in those days, Rubin was the DJ at NYU and was also the chairman of the social committee. The Beastie Boys were major admirers of his dorm parties, and when they found out he owned some of the equipment they wanted to use in their shows, they asked him to DJ for them. Through collaborative efforts, Rubin and the Beasties were able to mold the band's sound in a way that would be included on their album License to Ill. Number 6. He started Deaf American because of Slayer The album Rain in Blood by the band Slayer presented Rick Rubin with the opportunity to launch a new record label called Deaf America. The band's previous record label, CBS Records, decided not to release the album because of the satanic implications that were present in it. The fact that Reign of Blood was able to achieve significant economic success by word of mouth alone, rather than through promotion on radio or television, only served to highlight the significance of the record. According to Tom Araya of Slayer, the heaviness wasn't there until Rick came along to produce the album, which he believes also applies to bands like Metallica, Anthrax, and Exodus. When Rain and Blood was reissued, Tom Araya pondered on the album and said Rain and Blood was their signature record and it was great that it helped pave the way for that sort of music. Number 5. Rick Rubin Discovered LL Cool J In 1984, Rick Rubin set out to record LL Cool J's first single, I Need a Beat. Rubin's approach to creating this track was maybe the key to Def Jam's commercial. LL Cool J was just about 16 years old when he entered Rubin's studio. 
The young rapper didn't have much experience in the music business, but Ruben saw potential in him. To create the track, Ruben used a simple drum machine and a bass line from another song. This created a stripped-down sound that allowed LL Cool J's vocals to shine through. The result was a hit single that helped put Def Jam on the map. From there, the label went on to release some of the most iconic hip-hop records of all time. Based on how well LL Cool J's song, I Need a Beat, did, CBS gave Rick Rubin a development deal and a $600,000 advance. Rubin and his partner Russell Simmons jumped at the chance to introduce their new kid of hip-hop to a national audience. The duo had already made a name for themselves in the New York music scene with their innovative beats and rhymes. They were confident that they could revolutionize the music industry and change the way people listened to music forever. Number 4. Rick's Studio is Said to be Haunted His state-of-the-art studio in his Laurel Canyon house is where the majority of his album's recording takes place. He came from more traditional recording studios, where he had previously worked. Rubin opposes modern recording studios and prefers to work in studios built in the 1950s or 1960s. Many who have recorded at the studio feel as if they were in a haunted house. In 1917, construction began on the house. It had previously been owned by gangsters, the Beatles had their first LSD experience there as a quartet, Jimi Hendrix resided there, and people had been born and died there. It had a long and illustrious past. In an attempt to connect with the otherworldly, Rick Rubin took part in a seance at his home. With the help of ghost specialists, Rubin hoped to communicate with any entities that may have been haunting his home. During the seance, Rubin experienced strange noises and movements where he thought he felt something. Though he didn't make contact with any ghosts, the experience was nonetheless interesting and left him feeling unsettled. Number 3. He Majored in Philosophy Rick went to the only college he applied to after he graduated from Long Beach High School in 1981. He went to New York University, where he majored in philosophy but had plans to go to law school in the future. But his true plans would be clear if you read his senior yearbook. I want to play loud, I want to be heard, and I want everyone to know that I'm not one of the herd, was his graduation quote. So he studied during the day and went to the local hip-hop scene at night. Even though he went into punk clubs often, he got into hip-hop before white America noticed it. For a while, he was the only white person in the underground scene of hip-hop. Rap and rock music would soon sound very different because of his skills. Number 2. He Adores Magic Prior to music, his primary emphasis was on magic. This love dates back to when Rick was 9 years old and has had a profound impact on him. He used to hang out at magic shops and had magician buddies who were in their 60s when he was 14. The nature of being a magician, their thought processes, how things function, and the mechanics of a scenario is something that accompanies Rick's work in music and aids him in being a studio wizard. Rubin's fascination with and enthusiasm for magic and music delighted his ever-supportive parents, who were as devoted to their son as he was to his passions. Rubin's mother would bring him to New York concerts, wait outside the venue until the act ended, no matter how late it was, and then transport her son home for a few precious hours of sleep before waking him up for school the next day. His suburban upbringing influenced his musical interests, which had begun to transition from rock to New York's blossoming hip-hop scene by his senior year. Number 1. Rick Invested in Wrestling Rubin goes on to say that he still enjoys watching wrestling today because it's a form of entertainment that is pure escapism, which provides him with a welcome diversion from his hectic schedule. His love for the sport was such that he and Jim Cornette established a professional wrestling promotion organization called Smoky Mountain Wrestling. The organization ran from 92 to 95. Smoky Mountain Wrestling was known for its hardcore style of wrestling and its use of regional talent. The promotion was also home to some of the most famous names in professional wrestling. Despite its reputation, the company was unable to secure a lucrative broadcast deal and continued to lose money until the middle of 96 when the wrestling industry began to recover. Cornette closed the promotion in December 95 to devote himself fully to the WWF after years of losing money and losing financial support from Rubin. 